You can actually leave the lights down because we have a few slides. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hosanna. Hosanna. Oh, yeah, say it like you mean it. Um, for those of you who have been staying after church for the past several weeks for our Sundays of Unified Prayer, which also spells soup, um, and we've been doing that, having some soup and some fellowship and some time of contemplation and prayer together, uh, we've spent the last weeks looking more closely at the last uh, 24 hours of Jesus' earthly life with us. That's been very nice, actually, because sometimes we go from Palm Sunday to Easter, and we kind of breeze through Holy Week, and we don't take some time to, to chew on this story. As for the first slide, we've been using artwork as part of our meditation, and this is Salvador Dali's The Last Supper. So we've gone from the upper room, next slide, to Gethsemane, Next slide. To the house of the high priest. And last one there, to Pilate's house. Pilate before the people. Next slide. As we recall these events, uh, Jesus' betrayal, his capture, his questioning before the elders and the high priest and the judgment of Pilate, the rejection of the people, and the acts of pain and humiliation, We've looked and contemplated all these, but before all these events, before this 24 hours, we have the story that is the focus of our worship and message today, and that's Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Jesus' very name means, what? God saves. And so the people are, in fact, yelling, God saves, save us, Hosanna, save us now. God saves. Save us now. And this morning, we have sung it. We have kind of whispered it, sung it. We have shouted it too. And we are saying, Hosanna, save us now. Not as a historical reenactment, but save us now. Save us now because we are people who worship the risen Christ. So this morning, we explore this. What are you asking? What are you asking when you whisper, or you pray, or you sing, or you shout, God, save us now? Background on the story, which you may be familiar with, but we'll recap. The people are gathered for, um, why there's so many people is they're gathered for the Passover festival. And the name, festival's name is from an old story, the story of uh, the instructions given to Moses by God, and the story of the people's slavery in Egypt and their part of their journey as they're led out of that slavery to a new land. And part of the story is that, and it's a little bit grim, that Moses announces God's intention um, to kill the firstborn of every human born on the 10th day um, and established in the first month. And to protect themselves, the Israelites do what? They put um, blood over the doorpost as a sign. They mark it with lamb's blood as a sign for God to pass over their homes. And it is a bit of a grim story, isn't it? But it's a reminder in the story that God is the source of life. And it was a message to Pharaoh that you're not the source of life. I am the source of life. So after this, Pharaoh agrees to let the people go. And every year at Passover, then and since, um, the Jewish people remember and they engage in this ritual and this celebration of this event. So that's the context for Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. It's the celebration of this festival. And it's a time of great joy and celebration and hope and renewal. And so it's into this setting, which is filled with excitement and joy, that Jesus comes riding through the crowd on the back of a colt. Now, as Michelle read the passage, and this one is the story as it's told in the Gospel of Mark, aren't, there's a lot about the colt, isn't it? 
in that story, on and on about the cult. So maybe there's something to pay attention to there. Um, the scripture says that it's an unbroken cult. It's a cult that has never been ridden before. So it's unbroken, it's wild. And so there's a symbol of Jesus, not riding on a high horse, but riding on this humble animal that's a sign of humility. Jesus is humility, but also a bit of a sign of defiance. He's coming in, riding on an unbroken, untamed colt. And there's something in that that says that Jesus is not going to be tamed either. He's, this man means to turn over things as they are and will ultimately not be controlled. So in this scene, no chariots, no fine horses, no, no banners, no warriors, just a nomad. That's what Jesus is, a small, scraggly group of followers, common people, and no more special than anyone else in the crowd, just former housewives and fishermen, really. But you would have wanted to be there, even though there was no king or an army officer. But the people were there because they had heard that this man could heal. And they had heard that he rose someone from the dead. And for people who were seeking a leader, there was plenty of sea. A common, somebody who seemed like a common person, and yet something very special about him, who could do miracles. And so the people were gathered for the possibility that lay with this person. And the crowds of people, were, they welcomed him like royalty. They created a kind of a red carpet, as best they could, um, on the ground, laying down their clothes, their cloaks, and also leafy branches. And the followers, that's them, the fishermen, the former housewives, they're used to this. They're used to crowds being around Jesus and people getting excited about Jesus. But this scene is very different. They're in Jerusalem. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. So there's very much defiance in Jesus' presence here. It's one thing to be out in the rural areas or on the road working the crowds, but coming into Jerusalem, which is the stronghold for the Roman army, is an entirely different thing. But Jesus' followers, they're seeing possibility too. A movement that started so small, just 12 and a few others, was becoming a movement, a movement of people. So here's the crowd, though. And they see mm, somebody with potential and possibility, and what? They're hoping for a Messiah. They're hoping for a leader. They hope that they will be saved from their oppressors, the Romans. But Jesus is a different kind of leader, yes? He's the one who stands up in the synagogue and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. He's the fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah. The king will come on a lowly donkey. The crowd cries out, Hosanna, save us. But what does it mean to them? They want saved from the Romans. They want a king. They want freedom from tyranny. They want their nation back. But how does Jesus actually save them? Well, as I said, there's something in that symbolism of that untamed cult that he, um, he is a more radical way of saving. When he gets into um, the city, the, the scripture reads that he goes into the temple. The story also reads, if you keep reading in Mark, he curses a fig tree, the first thing, for not bearing fruit. He questions, the, uh, the, he's hit with all these questions of his authority, his ideas on money, um, his, his theology. <laughs> he, uh, he says this, give the money back to Caesar. He says uh, these radical things. He says the greatest commandment is to love others. And in a parallel gospel in Ma Matthew, he goes after those uh, religious leaders. He says to them, you make rules for people that you don't even follow. You keep people from entering the kingdom. You 
You are sons of hell. You've put your faith in the laws of men, not in God's law. You play religious, but you've forgotten justice and mercy and faithfulness. You are a brood of vipers. Again, he doesn't come in softly. He comes in with, uh, with his words and his actions that mean to overturn things, to usher in a new kingdom. Can you imagine if that were today? I mean, seriously, can you imagine if Jesus came down 8th Avenue um, into our city, into Oakland, into our church? What would it look like? What would it mean for us to say, Hosanna, 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 save us, save us. And what are we really wanting to be saved from? Hmm? We've talked about it a little bit through Lent, saved from our envy, saved from our pride, save us from our apathy, save us from our fear, save us from our hopelessness, and save us in a bigger sense from our broken systems, from our entrenched way of seeing things, from, our, uh, from oppression and injustices that we see around us. Save us from the things inside and save us from the bigger things too. But that's radical to invite that in. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he has to go through what's called the beautiful gate. And that gate stood for, well, the temple came and went and was rebuilt. But still, even in the 16th century, um, there was a gate there. And in the 16th century, this is, of course, many hundreds of years after the time of Christ, the leader at the time was... Um, the leader of the Ottoman Empire, that's who was in charge then. And his name was Sultan Suleiman. But his full title, his full title, this leader at the time, is Suleiman, his imperial majesty, grand sultan, commander of the faithful, and successor of the prophet of the lord of the universe. <laughs> By the time you said all that, right? <laughs> I gotta read it one more time. Solomon, his imperial majesty, grand sultan, commander of the faithful and successor of the prophet of the Lord of the universe. Yeah, he's feeling pretty special, that's true. Well, you know, this guy was really nervous about a Messiah entering through those gates. So you know what he did? He sealed them up. He sealed them up, because uh, obviously he, he has security problems. So <laughs> he sealed them up so that he could remain um, this ultimate grand something of the universe, as if that would stop, if that would stop anyone, if that would stop God. But we see it that way sometimes too. If you're going to invite Jesus in to this gate, this gate, through this, these walls, if you're going to really say, save us, watch out what you, for you ask for. Watch out for what you ask for. Because Jesus doesn't come in. He comes in humbly comes in humbly, but he comes in radically as well. He means to overturn things in me and in you and in through us in this world. So there you are. You have a palm branch clenched in your fist. Imagine it. You shout it. You whisper it. Yes, save me. Save me. What is it that we need saved from? Again, all these things. Some people like to narrow it down like this. Well, saved from hell. That's what we're being saved from. Saved from a fiery lake of hell. But when you do that, you, I think you limit Jesus. If you think of hell as where sinners burn in a lake of fire, then Jesus just becomes a key, like a magic key, um, to save you from that. If you're not sure what hell is, then Jesus is still that baby in a manger that you visit at Christmas. If hell just means, ah, I'm uncomfortable, then Jesus just comes into your life as someone who can maybe make you happy. If you think, well, there's just no such thing as hell, well, then Jesus just comes in with glasses and books and he's just a very good teacher in your life. If you think hell is, well, a horrible place, 
where people look and act different than us, well, then you look in the mirror, and funny enough, Jesus looks just like you. But if you see it this way, hell is anything that keeps us from wholeness in our lives, that keeps us from whole relationship with God and each other. Hell is isolation from ourselves and others. It's being alone, without meaning, without identity, without love. And Jesus is the one who comes in humbly, but mightily, strongly, untamed love, giving us untamed grace, radical forgiveness. Thanks be to the one who endured separation from God on the cross, was dead, was raised to life, who is alive, and who comes to us answering our question, will you save us? Can you save us? Who will save us? Jesus, who brings us grace, forgiveness, reconciliation, redemption, and new life. Amen.